who is a senior lecturer at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. She is a midwife and her academic interest this afternoon, she will be sharing with us some of her work in sub-Saharan Africa. So I'd like to hand over to Dr. Tracy Mills. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> It's, it's great to be here. Can you, can you all hear me? <laughs> it's always difficult to know, isn't it? That's yeah. great. Um, so it, it's a privilege to be asked to um, share some work that we've been doing in Africa with you. Um, so uh, I'm very grateful to uh, my colleagues, uh, Nazrat Hussain and Asim uh, Chowdhury for inviting me uh, to give this talk. So I'm coming from a slightly different place, I think, um, to, to most people who've spoken in that uh, I'm a midwife. So um, my interest in uh, mental health came from um, being involved in looking after women who had uh, complications and developed um, mental health problems. And um, we moved on to do some work um, around stillbirth and neonatal death, which is obviously itself a considerable risk factor. Uh, for the development of uh, perinatal mental health issues. So just to give you a bit of background, um, this is really a huge public health issue. So um, there are around 2 million stillbirths and around uh, 2.5 million neonatal deaths every year. So that's one baby dies somewhere in the world every 16 seconds, which I'm sure you will agree is an appalling toll and a tragedy for the parents who are effective. So 98% uh, of, of these deaths occur in low and middle income countries and uh, of those the greatest burden fall on South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Most of these deaths would be preventable um, had women access to high quality maternity care in those settings. And I think it's important to realise, uh, as many of the speakers have said today, that within um, the settings that we work, actually the risks of poor outcomes are increased for vulnerable populations. So women living in poverty, those living in conflict zones affected by uh, any other type of instability. Next slide, please. So just, just thought it was helpful to show you a map of where stillbirth rates are highest in the world. So the bigger the blue circle, the, the higher the rate. So you can see uh, India, Pakistan, some countries in Africa are significantly affected by this issue. And if we go to the next slide, if we look at the places where um, the research activity um, to try and mitigate the effects of perinatal deaths going on, it's an absolute mirror image, isn't it? So most of the research is actually taking place in high income countries and there's very little investment in where the problem is greatest. Next slide, please. So um, from uh, uh, an impact uh, perspective, the, the death of a baby is amongst uh, the most traumatic experiences that any individual can face in their life. And it has huge, um, uh, emotional and psychological impacts on um, women and partners. Um, this uh, can increase the risks for the family in terms of breakdown. Uh, many women, particularly in low middle income countries, also experience considerable uh, stigma and um, uh, poor responses in their communities if their baby dies. There are increased costs for health services and um, also for government. So it, it really is an extremely um, important problem to tackle. Next slide, please. So we know um, that, that um, grief in response to the death of a baby is completely normal. And most women and partners do um, manage to cope with their grief and adjust and, and, and return to the, the new normal that follows this experience. But um, stillbirth and neonatal death are a particular um, cause of protracted and prolonged grief, which significantly increases the risk of psychological distress and poor outcomes. So we're thinking about anxiety, depression, um, PTSD, or um, uh, much more, more common in, in parents of ex experienced bereavement. Now, most of the research has actually been done in high income countries, but this does show that, that around 25 to 30 percent of parents who experience a stillbirth will experience protracted grief. 
and also that um, postnatal support, particularly in the early postnatal period, is key um, to improving um, outcomes and reducing these risks. And uh, now um, around the world, we're, we're encouraging um, women to um, access birthing facilities to improve outcomes. So um, the role of health workers in providing this initial support is, is absolutely crucial. And we know in high income countries that the quality of initial support in the days and weeks after the death of a baby is um, absolutely key in minimising poor outcomes. But we know very little about the response of health systems in low and middle income countries. Um, and as Celia very, very uh, eloquently explained in the last presentation, context here is crucial. Um, it's, it's, it's not going to be um, effective to just import interventions that we know have been effective in um, helping to support parents from one context to another. Cultural beliefs and practices are very different. Um, I mentioned the stigma and taboo, which is different in different countries. Um, and there are also some um, particular issues that affect women in low and middle income countries, which we don't see in high income con context. One of these is particularly issues around physical morbidity that complicate um, uh, complex pregnancies and birth that might um, result in stillbirth, uh, particularly things like obstetric fistula. So the um, uh, international reports that um, have just recently um, raised the profile and calls for actions around stillbirth have emphasised the importance of um, improving support for parents whose baby dies. And um, our uh, midwifery-led um, research group in Manchester, as we were at the time, um, got uh, an award in 2017 of uh, an NIHR Global Health Research Group on stillbirth. Um, so that picture there just, just shows you our group, which is led by Professor Dame Tina Lavender, who um, with myself has just moved to the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. Um, this group is um, midwifery uh, led and we work with a network of um, six countries in sub-Saharan Africa and the Lugina Africa Midwives Research Network, uh, which uh, Professor Lavender has spent many years um, working with to in increase research capacity. Um, the uh, bereavement care strand of the research um, has actually been done with um, Kenya and Uganda, uh, particularly, and uh, those countries have uh, stillbirth rates of around 10 times what we see in the UK. So um, good places to work with in terms of trying to improve care. Um, we work very much um, around the MRC framework uh, for developing and e evaluating complex interventions in healthcare. So um, each stage of our work relates very much to um, this cycle for um, understanding your context, feasibility and piloting, then evaluating and implementing your interventions to make sure that they are um, suitable for the context in which you work. Next slide, please. So the first stage of this work was to understand a little more about the experience of parents and health workers of care and support in um, Kenya and Uganda. So we um, did a qualitative study, um, which was informed by phenomenology. So lived experiences obviously were very important. This was set um, focusing on the interface between parents and health workers in facilities in both rural and urban areas in Kenya and Uganda. So um, we recruited a sample of parents who had experienced um, the death of their baby um, and were cared for in that facility within the previous year because we were very interested in current care. Um, we also uh, interviewed uh, health workers who regularly provided care for parents after the death of their baby. So we ended up conducting one-to-one um, -one interviews with um, 75 women, uh, 59 partners and 61 health workers. So it was quite a, an extensive qualitative study. So I'm just going to give you um, a, a flavour of the findings uh, from that study. Mm -hmm. So if we move to the next slide. Um, so all the parents we um, interviewed um, really uh, 
put over the the profound shock and distress that they felt um, after um, finding out their baby had died. Um, so even in these contexts where um, the death of, of a baby is much more common than we would see in high income countries, um, there were very, very sort of common experiences of shock and distress at the death of the baby. Um, they often felt that um, the information that they received and the communication from health workers um, was not what, what they would have wished. So uh, for instance, um, uh, Bakirwa, who was a, a woman in Uganda, um, experienced very distressing um, experience with um, finding out about the death of her baby. So um, she was having a scan uh, because she'd gone to hospital with a complication and the doctor who was performing the scan had a group of medical students in the um, scan room with her. So she didn't say anything to the woman at all, but she just said um, to the students, uh, when this happens, I hear that the placenta dis detaches from the baby, something like that. The baby suffocates and the baby's not getting oxygen. So this has led to the death and so the baby has died. So this woman found out about the death of her baby by overhearing it in a conversation and wasn't directly told, which she found extremely distressing. Next slide, please. So parents also told us they didn't feel that they were a priority for the staff in the facilities. So often these the, the hospitals they were cared for uh, were very busy and um, uh, understaffed and the staff didn't um, have time to, to talk to them or um, answer their questions. Um, they also found that some of the practices, policies and rules within the facilities were not very helpful. So some mothers told us that, uh, for instance, their partners were not allowed to visit them after the baby had died. Um, they were often uh, intercepted at the, at, the, um, at the little hut outside the hospital and told they couldn't go in until the visiting hours, even when the partner had said, well, you know, the baby's just died and my, my wife's very distressed. They still weren't allowed to go in. Um, Staff also made quite a lot of assumptions about um, what they thought were the, were the best thing to do without discussing it with, with the parents. So uh, quite a few of the women um, didn't get the chance to see and hold their babies um, after the baby had died and after the birth, which, which they really wanted to do. And this sometimes was be because the staff had made an assumption that this was, was not something that they should be doing. So CC was a mother in Kenya and she said, to us that, you know, a mother is a mother, even to a dead baby. I would have wished to hold the baby, but I think that the nurses saw my grieving and they thought that this would uh, have aggravated my pain. So immediately they took the baby away. So then they never asked her what she wanted. They just did what they thought. And sometimes this came from a really good place, but, you know, it, it, it wasn't really very helpful to the mother. Um, parents also told us that um, uh, communities and their friends and family were very important um, to them in um, trying to cope with the death of their baby when they went home. They had some really, really good support and, and communities um, did rally round and were, and were very supportive, but, but sometimes um, parents had, had negative experiences. Um, so there were quite um, often um, rumours in the community about the causes of the stillbirth. Um, so um, things surrounding witchcraft and, um, you know, that maybe the, the baby had died because the woman was HIV positive. Um, and sometimes, you know, the parents overheard these rumours and that was very, very difficult for them as well. Next slide, please. So we, we also interviewed health workers and um, the health workers, it was obvious, um, were, were trying very hard in often very, very difficult circumstances to um, do their best to support the parents as much as they could. Um, and often they had not had any um, formal preparation or education for this part of their role, which they found extremely challenging and very, very, very difficult. Um, there was also um, quite often not enough support within the institutions um, for, for um, looking after bereaved parents. So uh, Agba, who was a nurse midwife in Uganda, told, told us, so they, that's the parents, get inadequate information. 
um, uh, the staff don't have uh, the skills to counsel them and we have no time for them. So you just leave her there crying. You have no time to come back again to console her. You have no time for her to tell you what she thinks about. So they felt very, very frustrated about how they were having to operate uh, in these very, very difficult situations here in these facilities. Next slide, please. So um, the qualitative study gave us some really important information about unmet, unmet needs in terms of um, both what, what parents needed uh, in order to help them cope better with the death of their baby and adjust, and also um, what support the health workers needed to give better care. So in terms um, of the parents, there were issues in uh, privacy, so they were quite often cared for in um, mixed wards after the death of their babies. So the mothers were um, next to mothers who had had live babies, and they found that very distressing. As I've said before, they weren't getting enough information, um, and uh, there were there were very few opportunities for parenting and memory making. So in terms of the death of a baby. Um, they, there's only a very, very small opportunity that the parents will get to make memories which are very important for the way that that those parents will cope with the death of their baby. So seeing and holding the baby, maybe taking some photographs and that often wasn't really addressed at all. Um, there were issues around respectful and supportive communication, but a lot of this um, was explained by the pressure on health workers working in really, really difficult um, circumstances in under-resourced facilities, having lack of education and training, and also um, issues around leadership and support for this part of their roles in these facilities in um, Kenya and Uganda. Next slide, please. So um, we have reflected with our research team and um, our community engagement groups and stakeholders um, uh, within our group um, to try and come up with some um, areas where we might uh, try and make some improvements. So developing some interventions that might, might be useful um, to address the problems that we've identified. So two main focuses for action were around uh, improving support for health workers. So raising awareness of parents' needs, um, educating and developing um, uh, practice in these facilities um, and um, looking at some opportunities to provide ongoing support for um, parents within the first few weeks and months after the death of their baby. So a, a very big difference between um, the healthcare system in this part of sub-Saharan Africa and what we're more used to in the UK is the lack of follow-up for um, bereaved parents once they go home. So there is no system of community midwifery or health visiting that, that follows parents up. So they're very much on their own when they go home. So um, we worked um, with our, um, our uh, community engagement group, our, our stakeholders, uh, our psychologists who specialise in uh, behaviour change um, theory to um, co-produce uh, an intervention um, that we, we, we could um, uh, go forward to test in a feasibility study. Um, so we, we had, our intervention co contained two main components. So the first component was um, around um, improving uh, care in facilities. So we took the care champions model, which has been used extensively um, across global settings to um, target particular practices and try and improve them. So this um, it involves identifying um, interested and motivated professionals in your facility, giving them some training and um, supporting them to identify what the particular issues in their area are and how, how they might address it. So we, we did this in the context of bereavement care. And the second part of the intervention um, was um, to um, provide some peer support. So this was um, recruiting some uh, parents who had previously experienced the death of a baby, giving them some training in peer support and supporting them to provide telephone peer support to women. So they, they were all women. 
Next slide, please. So um, the next stage on was obviously feasibility. So the question here was, can the research be done? Um, is the intervention feasible and acceptable in this context? And this is where we're up to at the moment. So we're in the process of conducting uh, a mixed method study. So this is a before and after study. Um, the reason for that design is that the, a follow on um, evaluation, so a, a full scale trial would be likely to be a cluster trial because of the um, service level changes needed to implement this intervention. You couldn't do it as an individually randomised trial. So this, this is the best sort of design to do a feasibility study. Um, we're doing this study in two hospitals, uh, one in Kenya, so that's Ken Kenyatta National in Nairobi, and another one in Uganda, so it, that's Nuguru China Friendship Hospital in Uganda. So the study um, is including uh, 120 women, so um, that's, that we, we'll recruit 40 to 60 women uh, per country, so 20 to 30 per phase. So the women will have had uh, a stillbirth or an early neonatal death um, in the facility. They will be 18 years of or over and we recruit them around two weeks after the, the birth and death of their baby. Um, at that point, they will be offered peer support. Um, so it's, it's a voluntary offer. They can either choose to take it or not. Um, we um, follow the women up at uh, six to eight weeks and we uh, assess grief intensity with uh, a validated score, uh, which is known as the perinatal grief score. Uh, Cecilia Esso, who's a professor of developmental psychopathology and the director um, of Centre for Applied Research and Assessment in Channel Adolescent Wellbeing at the University of Roehampton. Dr. Esso is also an advisor to the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime and on the development and the dissemination of TreatNet family intervention for adolescents with substance use disorders. As you can see, Professor, um, we're quite fortunate to have um, Professor Esso with us this afternoon and I will let her kick off. Thank you, over to you. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this conference. I have enjoyed it so much since this morning. So the title of my presentation today is Culture Aspect of Anxiety Disorders uh, in Young People's Implication for Treatment. Could you move to the next slide, please? So this is kind of an overview of my presentation today. I'm going to be talking about what we know about anxiety in young people pre-COVID and also during COVID period. I'm going to talk very briefly about our work on cross-cultural aspects of anxiety and then go on talking about an intervention program uh, called Super Skills of Life that we develop and which is widely disseminated in 18 countries worldwide. And then with that, I'm going to be talking about some of the challenges, but also opportunities in transporting evidence-based psychosocial intervention to different cultures. Next slide, please. So anxiety disorders, what do we know about anxiety disorders? We know that anxiety disorders in children and adolescents are very common and it's also serious. Uh, we know that approximately 10% um, of children and up to 32% of adolescents in the general population uh, are affected by anxiety disorders. We also know that uh, it's a complex uh, disorders, uh, tend to be more common among girls than boys. There are a lot of speculation why this is the case. Some some suggest that it has to do with socialization, so the way in which um, parents raise those children. Some also suggest that there might be some hormonal, uh, it might be related to hormonal uh, uh, cycle. And yet there's some studies that shows that girls tend to be uh, more, more prone to traumatic events that would then lead to uh, anxiety disorders. We also know that anxiety disorders um, um, is significantly um, associated with impairment in various areas of life, so emotional, social, and academic development. 
next one, please. Next slide. What we also know is that um, anxiety disorders comorbid very highly with other disorders. Um, but what it really means, we don't really know. So if uh, young people have anxiety and depression, the likelihood that they have, uh, if they, I mean, if they have anxiety, the likelihood that they have other disorders is very high. So in most studies, it's about 75%. But the meaning of comorbidity is really unclear. And this is one of the recent papers that we have where we uh, use uh, Latin class analysis to look at over 10,000 adolescents. And from here, we can see that there are three different clusters of, um, of, uh, of disorders. So we have one with this uh, categorized with emotional class. So these are the children and adolescents that have a high comorbidity of anxiety, depression, and intermittent explosive disorders. And then we have another group, what we call behavioral um, um, comorbidity. So these are the group that have substance use and behavioral disorders and also depression. And we have the normative group. Can we move to the next slide, please? So as I mentioned before, we don't really know what comorbidity actually means. Some people said it might has to do with our classification system because we, we have different kind of, um, of disorders. But then within the disorders, you know, they tend to be overlap in the symptoms. Some people said it might be related to uh, different risk factors. So in this analysis, um, uh, a paper it came out last year, we use a symptom network connectivity um, approach to look at the different uh, disorders and try to find out the dynamics between these disorders. So here in this particular paper, we look at major depression and uh, social phobia. And what came out from here is low self-esteem. And we have another paper which is under review. It also where we look at anxiety, depression, GAD. In that paper, we also found low self-esteem and worry to be a very important um, symptoms that link these uh, different disorders. Next page, please. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, what we know also through various uh, longitudinal studies is that when, um, when anxiety disorders start quite early in life and if they are untreated, they tend to be uh, chronic and they tend to also increase the risk of developing other mental disorders in adulthood. Next slide, please. So this is one of the studies that we conducted some years ago. This is a follow-up uh, study, 16-year follow-up. So we um, assessed these young people twice during adolescence and then one time when they were 24 years old and then one time when they were 30 years old. So what we did here was we divided the age of onset of these young people developing anxiety disorders at 11 and below and between 12 to 18 years old. To our surprise um, is that those adolescents, those um, participants that have their anxiety the first time during the adolescence period, they were actually the one that have a more negative outcome. So they tend, so the fact that they have um, um, anxiety disorders during adolescence for the first time increased the risk of developing anxiety, depression, drug and alcohol at the age of 30. Okay, next page, next slide, please. So we also look at the psychosocial impairment and here we can see also that those that have an, an anxiety within adolescence onset tend to have a poorer uh, physical health, poor uh, adjustment at work, have more problems uh, within the family, were less satisfied with their life, and have more chronic stress and poorer uh, coping skills at the age of 30. Next one, please. 
So that was all pre-COVID. So we also did uh, some um, studies during the COVID period, during the lockdown. And here we, uh, we were quite interested to find out what happened in the family. So here we have 927 caregivers in, in the UK. So these um, families have children aged five and 11. Uh, what we found out that here is that there is a very significant correlation between caregivers' uh, level of psychological distress and most of the children' emotional and behavioral symptoms during the lockdown. So it's we have 23 symptoms altogether and 20 of them were highly correlated. And we also asked the caregivers how it was uh, how, how it is to live together, uh, not uh, being able to move uh, out of the house uh, during the lockdown. And again, here, uh, caregivers that, um, that uh, reported that they have, you know, a lot of tension within the household, that um, 22 out of the 23 symptoms we asked were highly correlated. Next one, please. In another study, we, all, we were quite interested to look at adolescence addiction. And we asked, uh, the, this one is particularly for adolescents. What you can see here is that the number of hours that the adolescents spend during the lockdown was much, much higher than uh, the one before the lockdown. So significant differences in terms of number of hours they spend during social media site, gaming, streaming services, and shopping sites. So we have, of course, this study is cross-sectional and we have no control really about what happened before COVID. So we have another paper uh, that is under review right now where we use the Millennium Cohort Study. So as some of you might know, Millennium Cohort Study was done from 2001 and um, and then they have until um, 2018, where the adolescence was at the age of 17. And then during the COVID time between March and May, they actually did a survey specifically uh, um, looking at the impact of uh, COVID. So we were able to, uh, to analyze and look at different profile of the adolescence at the age of 17 and find out what happened to those adolescents during the COVID time. And we actually uh, found out four different profiles and those that have very high symptoms at the age of 17 um, were very likely to have a more mental illness than those in other profile. And then we also identified one profile which is which is related to emotional regulation problems, we found that during the COVID time, those are the adolescents that were more likely to uh, try to commit suicide. So I think that's, that's a very, um, very important finding. So the next one, please. So in terms of the risk factors, there are a lot of that. So this is a summary of the literature out there. So being female, having cognitive dysfunction, uh, experience life events, and uh, there is also a family aggregation and uh, environmental factors. So our work has focused quite a lot on uh, environmental factors. Uh, next slide, please. So that kind of lead us to our work in cross-cultural psychology. So culture, as we see here, is defined by John Berry, and I think it has not changed much since then. Uh, it is a learn and share pattern of behavior, which is characterized of a group living within very definite boundaries, interacting socially among uh, themselves. What is really important is the two aspects of culture, the explicit aspect and also the implicit aspect. So the implicit aspect is more the values, the beliefs and attitudes uh, people have. Could you... Uh, Move to the next slide, please. And my interest uh, in cross-cultural re research is really to gear up, you know, what happened if we have an intervention. I'm sometimes quite nervous when I see colleagues in other culture, um, you know, trying to just simply um, translate uh, 
you know, the Western med intervention to other cultures without really taking into consideration about what's happening in their culture. So, so in terms of doing cross-culture um, research, I'm very interested to find out, you know, are there any commonalities in terms of factors that lead to the development of anxiety? Do people have the you know, different or similar explanation of anxiety and what lead to help seeking behavior? Because I think in our research seems to show that it's very much connected. And of course, one of the things that we have done quite a lot in the past was looking at the different theories uh, that have been developed in Western countries and try to find out if, that, if we can generalize that uh, to other cultures. Next one, next slide please. So one of the, uh, I mentioned before, there is a family um, aggregation in, um, in anxiety disorders. So studies shows that if parents have anxiety disorders, the likelihood that the children have anxiety is up to five times higher. And from a psychological point of view, this is kind of the model that, it, that has been proposed and has been tested quite a lot actually. Um, so the transmission pathway is through parenting modeling and also through reinforcement of uh, uh, anxious behavior and through information learning. So that means that parents are actually communicating messages to their children about the danger and situations that should be avoided due to uh, potential harm. Uh, there are a lot of studies, but because of time, I'm not going to go through all those studies. Um, yeah, so, the, so one of the studies, maybe next one, next slide, um, next slide, next slide. The order was kind of mixed. Yeah, no, the next one, before this one. No, <laughs> okay, before, before, yes, this one. Okay, so what we did here, we, what the Hong Kong one, Yes, this one. So what we did was here, we compare uh, and also we compare the prevalence and also the correlates of anxiety in Germany and Hong Kong. And what we did was trying to test the, the theory about the transmission pathway. What we found in the German adolescents is that, uh, you know, these three models fit very nicely uh, in the German model, but we cannot, but it, we cannot support that. In the Hong Kong, um, in the Hong Kong data. So what we found in the Hong Kong data is a very high correlation between competition to do well in schools and the level of anxiety that these young people have. So we don't really know what happened, and I we think this is the reason why it might be the case. We thought it might be related to a cultural way of interacting which makes learning model involving parent less salient in the Chinese culture. So, uh, so in a Chinese culture, anxiety is very much related to the immediate, extrusively driven pressure in learning and to compete. Well, as in a German culture, um, it's much more related to growing up experience in, uh, in, a, in a family. And also this one, uh, we have done quite a lot of work uh, with our Japanese culture, looking at Taijin Kofushu. Taijin Kofushu is a very old concept. If you look at the history of psychiatry in Japan, it has already been written since the 1920s. So it's actually a disorder of fear of interpersonal relations. So it's, it's a culture bound syndrome to social phobia but the focus is very different. So we see here, the similarities involve fear of negative evaluation from others and avoidance of social situations. So the difference is that it's the focus, right? In social anxiety, the focus is on fear of embarrassing oneself. Whereas in Taijin Kofo Shu, it is the fear that one's body parts and functions displease, embarrass, or, or are offensive to, to the others. Next one. So there are a lot of speculation, why, why is it so different focus? So we have done quite a lot of work trying to find that out. But what we found is that 
So we gave uh, young people in England and the UK a different situation and then uh, measure their, their anxiety uh, level. But what we found here that is that in Japan, the distinction between the different social anxiety situations are less outstanding than in the UK. Next one, please. Yeah, so in another study, this is a two generation study. It's actually three generation, but so far we managed to look at the uh, adolescents and the parents. Instead, we also have data looking at the grandparents. But what we see here, so we measure not, uh, we measure the self control uh, uh, concept. So independent is very much related to individualistic culture and interdependent is very much related to uh, collectivistic culture. But what this particular slide show is that um, the adolescents in, in Japan are very much related similar to the adolescents here in the West, well as the, the, the parents are very much different. And we also see that uh, highly correlated uh, with Taijin Kofushu. Next, next one, please, next slide. So what do we do? What do we know about cross-cultural research? So um, what we know is that there is culture differences in the risk or correlates of anxiety. We also know that there certain behavior are more acceptable in other cultures than in, in some cultures. And the way we um, people cope with anxiety in different cultures are very, very different. Um, there's also, you know, people manifest uh, anxiety symptoms in different cultures. Uh, it's also very different. And actually it's quite interesting because um, people in different cultures have ways to help uh, you know reduce anxiety is actually part of our part of our um, part of the way we live but also um, some something that we do in particular culture also tr you know try to trigger anxiety i remember going to an to an um uh, going to one of the schools in in asia last summer and there was a big sign with 30 30 days and I said what is that 30 days mean and it's actually uh, reminding the students at that particular school is that there are 30 more days to a state exam you know so things like this and we also know for example in some cultures um, they would play music music in the washroom for example so that when you are doing your business in the washroom uh, other people will not hear you so this is this is something that is going on uh, in a uh, normal everyday life which is part of our of the way we live but it's also can be triggering anxiety but also reducing anxiety but when we talk about culture we all often talk of culture as equal to countries but that's but that's actually not true because even within the same family you know across the generation there are differences as well get the next page the next one next slide so in terms of health, mental health services or, uh, utilization, this was the study uh, we done many years ago. This study is actually quite interesting because this was conducted in Germany. The German health system is very comprehensive and it's not a gatekeeper system. So that means you can go to any specialist you would like to. But what you can see here is for those who have any anxiety, about 18.2% of them actually did seek treatment. So uh, compared to the US data, which shows like 68% or 70%. So, um, so here on the right-hand side, we were looking at what are the factors that predict mental health utilization. So this includes things for anxiety. This includes things like suicidal attempt, age, comorbid disorders and parental anxiety and depression. Next slide, please. So we know in um, childhood and adolescent anxiety, uh, CBT is the treatment of choice. So across studies, there are about 60% of the children actually responded positively to CBT. 
But we know in some countries, especially in low resource setting, uh, CBT is not easily accessible. What we also see is that almost all the programs are very uh, disorder specific. Some of the some of the intervention like coping cat is actually very long, so it is 18 to 24 uh, session. So in a lot of studies that we see a lot of high attrition. So it's partly because of the length of the intervention. And our own studies also show that um, there is a lot of discussion whether or not younger children could actually understand the basic concept of CBT because of their cognitive development. Next slide, please. Next slide. So what we have been doing recently, uh, well, recently is not quite recent, so it's about six years now, uh, we have developed a program called Tridiagnostic Program, which is called uh, Super Skills for Life. The reason for doing this is, you know, we see, as I showed before, there is a high comorbidity between anxiety and depression, and also the fact that, you know, smaller, younger children can have problem uh, understanding the C part of CBT, the cognitive aspect. So we introduced the concept of behavior activation. Active, behavior activation was, was a very popular intervention for adolescent depression in the 70s. So it's really involving children to do sports, to do um, things that will give them positive reinforcement from the environment. And what I show before is that you see um, there are common risk factors across disorders. So this includes low self-esteem, low, um, very poor social skills and also cognitive dysfunction. Um, and I think if, and it's not only anxiety and depression, these are actually, these three uh, risk factors are common across almost all uh, disorders. Uh, next one, please. Next slide. So this is our Super Skills for Life. So it has different component. It has a component of cognitive behavior therapy. Uh, it's a behavioral activation. We have a lot of social skills training in there and we target core risk factors of comorbid disorders. But by coincidence, we also introduced this concept of video analysis and feedback. I said it's a, be, by coincidence, because when we did a pilot study, I was very keen to, to have more objective measures of our intervention outcome by having uh, children talk for two minutes before and after the intervention, because then I can look at more the behavioral indicators of anxiety. But then even after the first session, children who never talk in class, who are very shy, their self-esteem just rock it up. You know, they start to talk, they start to put hands up in, in class uh, according to the teachers. So we thought um, if that's the, the case, then we need to integrate that in our intervention. And only after we have started to analyze our data and did some literature review that we found out that, you know, other people uh, that have done intervention with adults also did use video analysis. Uh, next page, please. Next slide. So we have four versions of uh, Super Skills for Life. So we have the preschooler version, uh, children, adolescents, and we just finished with the young adults version. It's meant for university students. So we, it can be uh, implemented in group as well as an individual format. And there's a website here and which will give you an update where in the world who's doing what there. So next page, please. Next one. So this is a study. I don't know how many, how much time I still left, but this is actually just came out. I, I just think at the time. So maybe about two or three more minutes. Yeah, okay. So we have, uh, this is the study we conducted in residential child institutions in Mauritius. So we have uh, two groups, intervention and wet list control. So 
we did this study in six different um, residential child institutions in, in Mauritius. So what we can see here is that we also did an uh, uh, executive function um, uh, experiment here, looking at inhibitory control. So what we see here is we see a significant reduction in uh, emotional and behavior problems. We see significant increase in adaptive uh, emotion regulations. Next one, please. Next slide. Yeah, and this one is really interesting. This is a study we conducted with uh, with my colleagues in um, in Spain, where we actually um, measure, you know, cardiac functioning of uh, young people who participated in uh, Super Skills for Life. What you can see here, there is a significant uh, reduction in cut in recovery indexes. Uh, uh, after the intervention, which is really good. So for SuperSkill, we not only have the report, uh, self-report questionnaires, but we also have, you know, measures of executive functioning. We also have measures of cardiac functioning uh, as an outcome measure. Next one, please. Yeah, and this, this particular one is quite interesting because this was conducted by school staff. Uh, so we... Um, so because most of the study we conducted as a researchers, we go to school, but this one, uh, we work with Caritas Salford in, uh, in Salford. We, uh, I train every year, 20 of their staff. So they're, they're, one of the things they did is really offering services to the different schools. So what we can see here is, again, we see significant reduction uh, in um, SDQ and also increase in um, self in self esteem, and we also have data on the on the video. Again, that um, it's very very much similar to the one that we have uh, in other countries. Uh, next one, please. Yeah, so we have quite a lot of studies out there. So if anyone is interested, please let me know. Uh, next one. Next slide, please. Yeah, okay, I will make this my last one. So I'm very interested. If you look this year, the uh, World Mental Health 2020 motto was really greater investment, greater access, everyone, everywhere. So I am very interested and a lot of my energy have been um, geared into promoting uh, disseminating super skills in low and uh, upper middle income countries. I think the reason is that the, the in, there's so much need and demand for mental health services. Um, and some of the ideas in Western countries seems to be accepted. And to the, I think, uh, you know, with our research in cross-cultural psychology and, and how we can adapt it to make it culturally sensitive. I think, um, yeah, I think this is something that I'm hoping to continue to do. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.